Hi, this is Charles Hoskinson, broadcasting live from warm, sunny Colorado, taking a brief break from my Digital Detox Sunday for you guys. So I was roaming around the farm and uh, news got to me through conventional means uh, that uh, the markets aren't doing so well and a lot of people are pretty upset about it. So I decided to come back and just talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics recently, which is mindfulness and resilience. You know, running a, a company is really hard. Anyone who's an entrepreneur, doesn't matter if they're CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation or uh, if they are running a McDonald's franchise, doesn't matter. There's a whole spectrum there. It's difficult. You have HR issues, you have employees, you have regulations and laws and taxes and customers and customers who are Karens and all those things. And what's really hard is when you have a collective event see the crypto markets are the crypto markets and the macro right now on the u.s side is that regulation is coming and on the china side there's a crackdown both of these have kind of put a needle into the balloon of the market and now things don't look so hot and unfortunately there's been a lot of people who have exceedingly unrealistic expectations about things and they've put in probably too much money into the crypto markets and now they're getting hit hard and the sky seems to be falling. <laughs> no matter how much you warn people and how much you talk about this stuff and how much you say, hey, uh, you know, be mindful and respectful that stuff that goes up goes down, people don't listen and they never will because they think that the minute that they get rich, that all the problems go away. I was actually more relaxed and happier when I was poor. There's never been a peer in my life where. I was, I was born rich or it was privileged. You know, my dad's a doctor, but it, he was the low tier of doctors and internist. And, you know, uh, those who don't specialize in medicine don't do as well as the rest. And uh, when I started input output, I lived off of a few thousand dollars a month. I was very poor and I had a lot of obligations I had to take care of and just somehow had to find a way to make it work. And those days were a lot simpler, a lot happier, more money, more problems, more assets. Anyway, I have some links for everybody and uh, they help me figure out how to deal with the ups and downs and deal with the, the onslaught and the publicity and the notoriety and also not to care about what people say and think and to let ego aside. It's a long journey. I've been on it for almost 10 years now in cryptocurrency space. I, and uh, I'll be on it for the foreseeable future. So I have to keep doubling down. So let me share my screen real quickly. Okay. All right. So that's my screen. So if we click right here, the first book I'd highly recommend, I read it last year. Uh, it's from Ron Siegel. Now, Ron's an interesting guy. He's actually from Harvard, and uh, he's a scientist. He's a PsyD at Harvard Medical School, and he's been studying mindfulness and all kinds of things. And he takes a very medical viewpoint on what meditation is actually doing and how it works in the brain and basically what it does for you for a physiological viewpoint. And what's nice about this publication is there's a, a corpus of exercises and things. There's even a, a series of 24 lectures on the great courses that kind of walk you through everything you need to know to, to get to where you need to go and practice every day. Then you can take a more philosophical side, and John Kabat-Zinn is, is kind of the, the godfather of these things, and he wrote a lovely book called Mindfulness for Beginners, and uh, it really approaches it from a practitioner's viewpoint, and he's, he's probably one of the best. If you're like me and you're always on the go and you need something to remind you, I think probably the best application in the world that's ever been built for meditation is the Calm app, and there's a lovely 30-day introduction to meditation from Jeff Warren. Uh, and Jeff has just got this really calming, nice voice. And the exercises are only about 10 minutes, 15 minutes long. Uh, and what's really nice about Jeff is that he doesn't come from an academic background and he doesn't come from, uh, you know, like a Buddhist background or anything like that. He's just a guy that you know, kind of liked cracking skulls and getting in trouble in his teenage years and his 20s. And he used meditation to help himself get out of all of that. And he feels pretty good about it. Now, in addition to that, there's a great guy. And if you want to go up a level, so you know, at the very least, you can buy a book. 
You can subscribe to an app, free or otherwise, and you know you can do that. If you want to go up a level, Cody Rawls is a psychiatrist, and he specializes in uh, brain interfaces, brain-computer interfaces, and he has a whole bunch of videos of various devices from NeoRhythm to Muse to other things that he's been thinking about playing around with. And in particular, Muse is kind of the market leader right now. And I've met the Muse people. They actually came to the IOHK Summit in 2019. And they've done some really cool things. And basically, this solves that problem in meditation of how do you know you're actually meditating? How do you actually know you're in a meditative state? The minute that you start detaching and not paying too much attention, uh, you start daydreaming and your mind starts wandering. And this is a device that helps you kind of stay in that zone and that detached zone and not think too much about things and not take the thoughts you have too seriously. Oftentimes, I'm told one of the goals of meditation is to imagine that you're just sitting in a lawn chair with a beer on a road, you know, and that's not too busy. And every now and then you see cars come by and you acknowledge that they're coming by, but you don't pay too much attention to them. And, those, and that's kind of what you'd like to do. And those cars are thoughts. You never really get rid of them. And this technology, this is kind of generation one. Generation two looks like this. So there's a great company called Kernel, and they've developed this insane headset, which is way too expensive for consumers. I think with all the sensors, this is about $100,000. But it gives you a beautiful brain scan, basically. And that brain scan uh, allows you to understand actually what's going on in the head and all the blood flows and so forth. You get tons of samples and it's just mostly used for research, but within five to 10 years, the cost will fall by 100x. And so a device like this will be about $1,000. And it allow you to get a significantly better read on whether someone's in a mindful state and what's going on with the default mode network and so forth. Uh, so it's really exciting to see where all of this is going. So that's kind of the meditation side of things. And why meditate? What's the value? Well, meditation doesn't make you superhuman. It doesn't make you learn super quickly. Uh, it doesn't somehow give you some special new power. Instead, what it fundamentally changes, I'd say, are three things. One, there's the event and the reaction to the event. And whatever the event is, it can be you've been cheated on or you've been fired from your job or you've just been diagnosed with cancer. It can be a very serious event or it can be a mild event like someone, uh, you know, cop pulls you over for a traffic ticket or, you know, someone flips you off on the road or something like that. Then your reaction, the problem most people have is as they get overloaded and there's a lot of stress and a lot of things going on, we tend to overreact to things. We tend to be overly emotional on things. And what meditation does is it gives you a better control valve to not immediately react to whatever the input is. Instead, what it does for you is it gives you the time to kind of calm down, chill down, and not be angry about something, to, to experience the emotion, but not be connected to the emotion. So you may experience anger or disappointment or sadness, but then it fades away, just like that car driving by, you know, on that road as you're sitting and drinking your beer, that thought, that emotion, that reaction goes away. So that's one thing. The second thing is it gives you the ability to be significantly more patient about life. You know, uh, it's a funny thing. Ada went from 240 down to 120. We're still up 500% this year, yet people are running around pretending like it's the end of the world. And ultimately, why is price even a metric? W the real metric is the social mentions, the wallet quantity, the fact that commercialization is coming, that, that we're right at the edge of smart contracts. After all these years and all this hard work, we should be celebrating the fact that we've made so much progress so quickly and that four years of hard work in the markets and six years of hard research and development and engineering are starting to pay dividends and fruit in that there's a beautiful platform that's coming. Uh, but you have to have a longer time horizon and you have to detach yourself from the chaos and madness of the day. And you have to start looking to the future and saying, the things that I do today, the investments I make today are good for me tomorrow, next week, next month, five years from now, 10 years from now. The crypto markets and social media have destroyed our ability to do that. If you look at YouTube, which is my generation's entertainment, and TikTok, which is the next generation's entertainment, 
with TikTok, uh, the average person spends about 52 minutes, I think, and they watch over 300 videos, distinct, unique videos. YouTube, it's about 40 some minutes and they watch about six to seven videos in that time period. So that's our attention span now. That's our notion of things. There's an instant stimulus. No matter how great something is, they say, what's the next big thing? Where are we going from here? The point of meditation is to break that and give you a great degree of calm uh, and uh, f give you the ability to be much more patient about things. And then finally, uh, there's this concept of of being able to steer meditation in a particular direction. And I forgot to put the book up, but there's a wonderful gentleman named Matthew Ricard, and they often call him uh, the world's happiest man. If you meditate over a long period of time, years, decades, over time, it changes the gray matter in your brain, neural connections in your brain because of neuroplasticity. And if you follow certain forms of meditation like empathy and love, uh, then you just start feeling happy and you just start feeling a collective empathy for everybody and a collective love for everybody. It's not a hippie thing. It's just you understand why people are upset and you give them the space to be upset without reacting to it or taking it personally. I receive an enormous amount of criticism in this space, uh, criticism for all kinds of things, things outside of my control, things in my control, things that happened 10 years ago, things that happened today. And I often ask, well, why am I being criticized about these things? In some cases, it's just commercial pressures where, uh, in some cases, it's ignorance. some cases, it's fear. In some cases, the critic themselves have a problem. And they're not actually criticizing me. They're just off-gassing the emotional pain and the problems that they have. And they want somebody to, to, to point to, to somehow make it better you know, whether it be a mistake or a personality issue or whatever it is, the superpower of meditation and doing it for a long period of time, it gives you, if there's any superpower, it gives you the ability to have empathy for your critics and for the people who hate you. And if you do it for long enough, it gives you the ability to love the people who hate you, even though they hate you. And uh, at some point that melts them and disarms them and the reasonable ones, they throw in the towel and they give up. The unreasonable ones, well, all you can really do is just love them, kind of like a drug addict relative or something. Now, that's the meditation side. Now, there's a philosophical side to resilience as well. And there's a lovely interview uh, that Lex Friedman did with uh, Sheldon Solomon, uh, who's a psychologist and a philosopher. And Sheldon's a big fan of Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death. And actually, this is a really interesting book. Ernest wrote it while dying of cancer in the 1970s. Uh, and really, it, it's the core of his life philosophy. This idea that everything in the world dies and everything in the world is trying to kill you in some way or another. Uh, and human beings aren't super good at dealing with death. And so what we tend to do is, is find a way to get it out of mind and then build social structures to protect ourselves from it. And then finally, we construct what are called immortality cults, these ideas that if you do something like you live virtuously or if you believe in a certain philosophy, that somehow you'll escape death when you die, go to either a paradise or you'll achieve some sort of immortality of mention where people will remember you because there's monuments to you and so forth. And a lot of the problems in the world come from these competing immortality cults in life philosophies. And instead, if you can embrace the concept of death head on and fight that dragon early, then you, when you escape it, you get to the other side and you have a tremendous sense of calm and peace because no matter what happens on the other end, uh, you already have a meaning in your life. A corollary to that in an earlier work was Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And it's actually a book I read when I was a lot younger and boy, it really helped me. Uh, and Victor uh, was a Jewish psychiatrist during World War II, and he served in, uh, he, he survived Auschwitz. He was there for three w years, and horrible, horrible things happened to him, and his entire family was murdered. And he covers this inside the book. And when he left the camp, everything about who he was was taken from him. His credentials were destroyed. His life's work was destroyed. All of his papers were destroyed. He had no children, no wife. 
And he had to basically reconstruct everything from the ground up. And this is really his his journey that he went on and uh, that and how he he figured out how to put his life back together. So I, I think these two books, in a certain respect, are interconnected to each other, one being the sequel to the other, despite the fact that people were so far apart. Becker was a very different person uh, than Frankel, but they're both connecting to the same thing, which is there's this concept in life where you have to find meaning. And you will not find meaning in people. You will not find meaning in things. You will not find meaning in status and merit. Everything that you have and are can be taken from you and probably will be taken from you at some point. Uh, you know, if you're beautiful, you'll get old and wrinkly. Don't believe me? Look at all the beautiful actresses in Hollywood in the 1950s and 60s. Look at them today, if they're still around. And, and if you think wealth will somehow solve all those problems, okay. Would you trade for a billionaire who's 99 years old? Would you? You know, or what about uh, having an enormous amount of wealth, but being absolutely depressed and unhappy? Well, you know, things don't solve problems for you at all. You have to find some sort of transcendent meaning in all things. The point of mindfulness is it's a technique to help you do that. Uh, it's something that when you go down this road, it gives you the ability to slow things down, look at the world dispassionately, get away from your biases and get away from your preconceived programming. And then it gives you the time that you need to start adopting a life philosophy. And whether that be something that Becker gives you or Frankel gives you or Stoicism or getting in touch with Christianity or Islam or whatever your particular philosophy happens to be, there is truth at the bottom of those wealth enough for you to find peace. So the markets go way up, the markets go way down, uh, but people often ask, how do you survive those cycles and all the criticism and you know the things that you deal with? Well, this is how I do it. I have the call map on my phone, and when I have some spare time, I meditate. It doesn't take too long, and boy, it really does help me. And uh, I follow this technology because this helps me know how to get to the next level, whether it be a flow state or you know which brain wave to train and so forth. And there's great companies on the horizon that are going to take that to levels that have never been seen before. And I listen to Lexus guys when they come on. There's always cool, interesting guests like Sheldon and so forth. And I read, I try to read a book every week. That's about 50 books a year, give or take, because you never have time to keep a schedule like that. I'm a very busy guy. And I read a lot of philosophy. And some is foundational stuff like the nature of truth and others is about life, you know, and where is life going and how do we find meaning in these days? Uh, and I try at my core just to understand people. Because so I have very much difficulty with that. Uh, it's sometimes difficult for me to parse people's emotions and read their face and understand why they do what they do or uh, how they are. I guess some people call that Asperger's or and some people just call that uh, difficulty with people. I don't know. But in any event, that's how I get out of it. And don't let the turkeys get you down, you know? The markets are the markets. They don't matter at the end of the day. And if things are real, they'll be here in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And my life's work and the point of this industry, I'd like to believe, is that we are trying to change the systems of the world. That's the closing thought. We are going to live in 25 to 30 years in a world that is not recognizable to those who live 10 years, 15 years before us. We're going to live in a world where AI is the dominant intelligence. Every surface is a computer. We're going to live in a world where everything is programmable, including your genetics, where virtual reality is indistinguishable from reality, and people will have relationships with virtual avatars which are indistinguishable from relationships with real people. We're going to live in a world where medicine has evolved to a point uh, where neurobiology can be hacked, neural trans can be hacked, where you can have any mind state that you want, from bliss to hate to whatever it might be. And we're going to live in a world where big data and pervasive computing has robbed us of our privacy, except for what we can claw out 
from immutable concepts like constitutions and blockchains and these types of things. We're going to live in a world where globalism is the standard. The problems that occur in Zimbabwe or Rwanda will no longer be in a newspaper. They're going to be your problems. And we learned that from COVID. Something that happened in Wuhan has impacted the entire world. And that's now the standard, not the exception to the rule. So you need new systems for this. You need new democracy for this, new way to vote, new way to think, new incentive schemes, new way to talk to people and communicate with people, to live with people and forgive people. If you can't do that, well, then what's going to happen is we'll descend into a world conflict. And the winners of that conflict will just install a new system or regress us back to before uh, we got all this technology. All you really can do is work on yourself and be a good person and try to evangelize concepts that you feel are important in this new order. For me, it's about systems and it's about giving people control and power over their lives. I don't believe for a moment that people are stupid. I don't believe for a moment that people are intrinsically evil and bad. And if you give people the ability to control their own lives, that everything will come collapsing down. Uh, there's no greater example of that in recent memory than when Texas removed all the mass mandates and the volume mandates. There was a lot of people who took the philosophy that by doing so, it was instant calamity and catastrophe uh, for Texas and the hospitals would be massively filled. And instead, two months later, it's as if they never did it. Why? Because people, for the most part, know how to stay safe. They wash their hands when they are in large crowds. They tend to wear masks. They stay home when they're sick. There is a collective understanding there. And if you extend that same attitude to every other aspect, from people's financial lives to their health to other things, for the most part, I'd like to believe, and there's evidence to this, that eventually we'll get to the right place. It's when we feel we have to abdicate responsibility, we get into a bad position. And that's the ultimate philosophical core of the cryptocurrency space. You're in charge. There are no leaders. Now there's great adherents and people who have visions and they want to take the crowd in a particular direction. But at the end of the day, no one is in charge because everyone's in charge. Everyone has an equal say. And there's a magic to have a social system that can run a government with such a characteristic. I don't want to be the next Steve Jobs. I want to be the guy that made Steve Jobs irrelevant. We no longer have to look to a great leader. The system will just identify a problem and the swarm within the system will find a way to solve that particular problem. So that's my life's work. And we target it towards Africa because... That's where I think it's going to get done first. But in any event, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope this helped you a little bit. And stay happy, you know. Don't sweat it. There's up days. There's down days. The horizon has really good days ahead. We're okay. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>